Hello, everyone. I'm Sam Ekman of Gold Derby here with the composer of Avatar The Way of Water, Simon Franklin. And uh, I would be remiss uh, to say this score is incredible. Um, and you actually worked on the first one with uh, James Horner, who we tragically lost in 2015. And I know you two worked very closely together. And I'm curious, what ways are you sort of honoring him and his music in, in this film? It was something that Jim and I both wanted to do. We wanted to, you know, we wanted to a honor him, but also there's a canon of Avatar films, and so you, you know, there are beautiful themes in Avatar One that we wanted to be able to use on occasion in the film. You know, the, you know, probably nine tenths of the score is is new for this film because this is a new film with new, um, you know, with uh, new characters, new um, vistas, new things that go on and so we caught you know where possible where it made sense we would you know use elements of avatar one and bring them full you know through there and you will see that more at the beginning when we're in the forest we you know we're more mm -hmm. connected to our a1 roots in in the early parts of the film before it evolves into going out to the sea um and that was a conscious decision by jim and me about how we uh, sort of evolved the score as it went through. Um, so, you know, I hope Jim, I hope James is looking down. And I hope he approves of what I've done. Um, and, um, and I think that after he died in 2015, I was, I was asked to take over and run uh, to, to write the music for the park. There's five hours of music to write for Pandora World of Avatar, the Walt Disney World Park uh, in Florida. And um, I was just finished that in the summer of 2017 when the park opened um jim cameron calls me in december 2017 says come and read the scripts for the uh, the the sequels and it wasn't just read avatar 2 it was read avatar 2 3 4 and 5. um and that was uh, important for him because he said you will need to understand the you need to understand the arc of the story and you, for you to understand where certain things happen and because on page one of avatar 2 there is this line that says natiri sings the song chord mm. um and because of this you know the the song he had written music into the script and he needed me to get that going straight away because natiri needs to sing the song chord and they were shooting that in March, April of 2018. So my first task was to write that and the, some other, uh, the song chord, and also some other on-screen indigenous and music. We know we've got lots of things we've discarded just because editing means that sometimes not everything ends up in the film. But the song chord was an essential part of this movie. Um, it's this idea that the Navi can sing their family history. So you can grab the song chord from your great grandfather and sing his life by going through the beads. Uh, and as she, we see her creating the song chord for her newborn children. And you, the, you put on the first bead and then you start singing their lives. And, and that was an essential concept for Jim. So I've written the song chord. I wrote it in Navi because it was an important thing to ground it in the film. It was, he wanted it to have the sense of the place. He wanted to have an ancient quality. It was a, the idea of a sort of like a traditional thing that everybody knows, almost like a, a um, rosary bead type thing where there's a chant that you do. Um, and it had to have a mother's love. She's thinking about her children. So that became an essential part. Once I got that and we then recorded Zoe singing it live on set and what you see on the screen is Zoe singing it live. I did not go into a recording studio and record that vocal as a pre-record and then she lip sank. It was uh, entirely live with a hundred technicians. I, I think everybody was quite stunned by the quality of, of her voice and and the performance that she gives, which is, which is uh, I think stunned, you know, like quite amazing. Um, yeah. So that gave me a core for the score, which mm. was this family theme, because I then expanded that the song chord into the family theme, the thing. And you hear it 
when they're leaving home tree. You hear it in various forms whenever it's to do with the family. You even hear it in a sort of, in another form for, there's a cue called um, From Darkness to Light. And that has a variation of that that goes through this beautiful cello line played um, uh, by a, a soloist in Los Angeles, which then is, a, you know, then gradually the orchestra grows around him. Um, and those were important touchstones for the score. And then we have all the new characters and we have the new worlds and I needed to evolve the textures. And my job in A1 had been all the textural stuff, the glowing forest, the sense of the gamelan, the bells and all those things. That we needed to find a new world because we're in a new place. And so the percussion stopped being glowing gamelan, started becoming uh, bamboo and wooden and yeah. these things called anklungs um, from, you know, uh, there was a, a conscious decision that I was going to change the sound of the tribe. The voices stopped being these rather hard, edgy cap at that things from A1. They became softer, more Polynesian, more Mongolian, uh, longer notes and textures and a, and a harmonic uh, structure that was slightly different. And these were all conscious decisions I made um, because we're going into these new vistas. And then Jim wanted me to then reflect the water so that there was also textures that we made for the iridescence of light that as the way the sunlight goes through the water and you see these crystalline sort of glistening things um as uh, as uh the fish go by there was a lot of this idea that j there was a textural quality to what we were doing as well as those thematic things hmm. Yeah, I've talked to a lot of um, a, a lot of creatives on this film recently, and they've all talked about this intense world building uh, that you have to do beforehand. And I know oftentimes composers aren't coming in till the end, but were you, I know you read the scripts, were you there as part of those world building sessions? Because it sounds like so much is built around the world. It, it was an essential thing. And we had a thing called Culture Club. Um, and Culture Club was me. Uh, Deb Scott, costume designer, Dylan Cole, who was the production designer for the Navi side of this, the, the world side of it, the, rather than the hard edge stuff, which is Ben Proctor. So Dylan Cole, uh, prop master, and also two researchers for us. Um, um, and we worked together because the idea was that everything should feel coherent. Um, and so I would come up with concepts about how I wanted things to do it, but they would be researched. The song chord is based on this idea of taking a spark and then that spark becomes the dawn. And then the dawn, you carry the light through your life, through the day to your, to the sunset. That's something that you see in indigenous cultures as far apart as, uh, Malaysia and, um, and the Arctic. You see it all over the places. But I had to show references because Jim has this mantra is you just can't get, make shit up. You had to give him something to say, right, I'm not just pretending this exists. There's a reason why this exists. And this is what happens on Earth because we needed to have a parallel so that it had an authentic nature. There are, there are things happening on screen where we absolutely took reference points from people and um, uh, like First Nations people that I talked to. I went up to the Chumash tribe uh, uh, up in uh, the middle of California. I spoke to their far keeper and he became somebody. He talked to me about certain uh, traditional ways of doing things. We had a, um, a, a, some, a shaman from an Amazonian tribe that we talked to and you will see uh, there are things in the film where there are rituals going on that are based on something that he said, this is why we do this and so on. And we all worked together in Culture Club to make sure that we had a coherent whole. And as, a, as you're right, most composers come in and we come in at the end and we never see anybody. You know, I'm friends with the stuntmen and women, you know, it's, it, which is very unusual. You know, I sit on set while we were doing things and we had this general sense of there being, um, there had to be a sense that everybody worked towards the same goal so that there wasn't uh, 
the re that everything resonated with the right energy. Hmm. And something else I love about the movie is that it has this real immersive quality to it in, in every aspect of it, but the, the score helps that immensely. And because you mentioned uh, Pandora, World of Avatar and Disney, I'm a huge Disney nerd, so I love walking around that land and, and hearing it come to life around you and hearing what comes to life in like the Flight of Passage ride. Did that experience there help you craft the immersive nature of this movie? Because it, it feels really, especially when you see it in 3D, when you see it on the giant screen, like you are dropped into a very living world. I, I think there's an element of that. Obviously, I've now, between the the uh, the many hours of music I've written for this and the five hours for the park and so on, I, you know, there there's an awful lot of Pandora in me now. Um, <laughs> So um, the uh, yes, I mean Pandora was the, the 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 world of Avatar was a thing that we um, we wanted to make sure. That again, there is that immersive quality, and this one this one was slightly different in that what we we're, we're trying to do is um, I have to sometimes be the narrator. In this film, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you take, um, the, uh, often there are areas when we're underwater, you know, because so much of this is underwater. When you're underwater, there's no dialogue, and if there's no dialogue and there's just sound effects, then sometimes you need something to help you with that f emotional flow, and the score is the thing that does this. And point is something that Jim and I talked about a lot was the idea that there may be nothing else but the music to tell you how to feel or to enhance that feeling that he's trying to get across um, uh, visually. You know, there are certain elements. There are times when, for instance, you will see characters who are conflicted about what they should do next, but they can't go, oh, what do I do? Because they're underwater. So the music has to do that. But the same thing goes, for instance, in the what we call the first swim, which is the cue is called into the water. It's the point when the kids jump into the water the first time. And it is just yeah. glorious. I remember the first time we saw this. I mean, the first time I saw the frame, I'm just going. <laughs> and then when you see it in 3D, you just go <sighs> even more. And I still do today. I still absolutely I've seen it tens of thousands of times and it still has the same effect on me. But there were there was a conscious decision I made here to try and make it the idea of that you almost had sirens calling you into the water, that these were the mermaids, you know, because there's uh, Sirea and Aonung who are from the Metkayina tribe, they dive in and they are graceful and they flow. And I wanted to get that idea of almost, they're not calling them to their death, but they are, the sirens are calling. And that was a, a vocal texture that I did um, there to, as the Mech, as the Omitakaya kids, as Loak and and Nateam and and Took and Kiri jump into the water, they're just effectively lummoxes suddenly appearing in the water, and I wanted them to feel like they're suddenly surrounded by this stunning beauty, and I needed to make that sense of that call of the water come through, um, mm. and that was a, a very conscious decision to do that, and then have this iridescence of the light that I we made a texture in three dimensions. You talked about the immersive quality. One of the things we did was create this glistening texture out of um, using manipulating tiny bell trees, not the way that normal people do or mark trees where they sit there going, this was like randomly playing notes and layering things and, and keys and other high glistening percussion to get this sort of shimmer that just surrounds you and immerses you in there. Um, and then the voices allow you to be, you know, you're, you're dragged by the mermaids vocally through the, yeah. the, the, the piece. Um, and I think that that was a thing. That's the theme. That's the way of the water theme. You hear it there, you hear it in the way of water, but you also hear it in the arrival of the Tolkoon. It's the same theme. It's just variations because it's about that connections with the water. Um, and that was an important theme for Jim as well. Mm. Beautiful effect uh, with all that water. 
theme music going on. Um, and quite differently from that is uh, there, you do contribute one more song uh, with The Weeknd, Nothing Is Lost, that uh, gets us into the end credits. And I always feel like end credit songs can either be really beautiful capstones or feel awkwardly tacked on. This one feels like a great capstone to the journey. So what is what was key to you to make that a successful moment there at the end? Jim and I talked about it a lot. Now, I, I obviously have a history of film songs. Um, and it's been something even from my day job when I used to do records. Um, and I, we both wanted something that felt like it was, it had to be organically connected. It had to flow out of where we were. Um, and it, we talked about who, if we were going to do a song, who would we want? And I wrote down one name. I wrote down The Weeknd. There were no other choices. We didn't approach wow. anybody else. That was it. Um, we wrote down The Weeknd. Uh, at least I wrote down The Weeknd. And then Abel, you know, we contacted him. We showed him a bit of the film. He loved what he was seeing. And uh, in September, you know, I started sending him some thematic material and also some lyrical stuff from things I'd done just to give him a sense of where we were and give him a placement for where the song was going to be and what it needed to come out of so that he had some some uh, stuff to work with. Now, he and the Swedish House Mafia then worked on a, an initial track. I was in New Zealand. They were in uh, L.A. and uh, I think in New York. They sent me this initial track and I listened to it and went, oh, yeah, OK, but what about if you do this? And I started bringing in more of the avatar textures, like the the voice, the ba -da -da -da, mm -hmm. which is again from song chord. But -da 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 -da. that opening line is is a hook that I use a lot in the score, um, and I use the big drums that we use, and then I put in the orchestral side of things. And I made you know, so I then collaborated with Swedish House Mafia on the production of the song, and Abel and I worked on how he wanted, you know, how his vocal melody and his lyrics were going to work to the point where we had something. And then to show Jim, Jim then said, hey, what about just tweaking these words a little bit? Because so it gets the right feeling. And I'm very, very proud of the way that I think it does naturally just flow straight out of the score into the film. And I think he's absolutely knocked it out of the park. Yeah, it's a great ending moment uh, to a fantastic score. Um, so fantastic work in this film. And thank you for, for chatting with me about it. For anyone who's watching, subscribe to Gold Derby. Make sure you stay with us the rest of this season. Simon, thank you again. It's been a pleasure. It's been my pleasure as well, Sam. Mm -hmm.